Okay, well, good morning. Can I get a little heat? Welcome to the bridge. Uh, lots of chatter. So in the light of the Halloween weekend, I have a joke for everybody. Is that all right? Who won, who won the skeleton beauty contest? Nobody. Get it? A few of you will get that later after somebody explains it. All right. Well, anyways, as we, as we begin worship this morning, we're, uh, this is the last sermon, I believe, in the Sermon in the Mount series. And so as we, as we wrap up this series, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that we've touched on. But today, we're really going to focus in on Jesus being the rock. And so these first few songs that we're going to sing, um, Jesus is the rock of our foundation. We're going to sing always uh, solid rock, songs like that. And so as we, as we begin to worship today, let's start wrapping our minds around the idea of what it really means to make Jesus that firm, solid foundation in our lives. So let's go ahead and stand uh, and greet one another, and we'll begin worship. Nobody. Ah. Well, good morning. Um, this song's always a great reminder when we talk about uh, my God will come through always, and He always does, doesn't He? Amen? God comes through for us. Let's sing together this morning, my foes are many, they rise against me. Here we go. My foes are many, they rise against me. But I will hold my ground I will not fear the war I will not fear the storm My help is on the way My help is on the way Oh my God He will not delay My refuge and strength always
praise him this morning. Good morning. If you're like me, you started learning. Well, if you're like me and you were raised in church, like when you were very, very little, you started singing about the wise man and the foolish man, right? You build your house upon a rock or built it on a sand. And the one thing we always know, unlike our homes, that sometimes the foundation gets shaky. Our foundation doesn't get shaky when we're standing on that solid rock, right? So let's sing this song that I know y'all know. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is Covenant his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I dead in him be found. Rest in his righteousness alone. Faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock. On Christ the solid rock I all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Amen. So now we will dismiss uh, just this is the fifth, uh, fifth Sunday. So we're going to send out birth through second grade. The rest of the kids get to stay with us. Um, so we're going to pray for them as they go out. Dear Heavenly Father, I just lift up the kids and the teachers to you, Lord. I just pray today um, in that present moment, in that room, in those rooms, God, that um, your love and your good news is spoken to their hearts, God. I pray as we can just give a little and incorporate your love and um, your forgiveness, Lord, and what you've done for those little children, God. And um, I pray that it just sinks into their hearts and um, as parents and or guardians or whoever gets to take care of these little kids God that we can just be your light and into their lives God so that they know more about you Lord just pray as we sing the rest of the worship song God that we sing our hearts out that it's genuine and it's not just a bunch of words that we sing God but that you see our hearts and how much we do love you and we are thankful for you God in Jesus name I pray amen Amen. So far, you know, we've sung about Him being there for us always in all things. We've sung about Him being the solid rock, the foundation. But He's also our protector, isn't He? And uh, we're going to sing a mighty fortress. And I love that part when we talk about a mighty fortress is our God and how He protects us. So let's join together. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the 
only righteous judge ruling over us with kindness and wisdom we will keep our eyes on you we will keep our eyes on you a mighty fortress is our God a sacred refuge is your name your kingdom is unshakable with you forever we will reign our God is jealous his own, none could comprehend his love and his mercy. Our God is exalted on his throne, high above the heavens, forever he's worthy. We will keep our fortress. Uh, you are our rock, and we just thank you for today. We thank you for uh, bringing us here. I pray now we would have um, ears that would be attentive to hear your word, and I pray that you would speak through Stephen and uh, through the message that he gives today. Change us, spirit, and I ask and I invite you, Lord, to come, and I pray that our hearts would be willing and open to surrender to you. Amen. You may be seated. As Nick shared, we are finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Jesus is a really masterpiece on what religion is 
is versus relationship with God. And there's this audience that's there and they're eager. And uh, this is kind of a, a word that's used a lot uh, anymore, but I think it communicates this well. The audience is leaning in. They're eager to hear what it is that Jesus wants to, to tell them and what Jesus wants to communicate to them. But then there are different reactions to what Jesus says. And as Jesus wraps up this sermon, he's aware of two different paths, two different ways that people can go, two different forms of teaching, and then two different houses and two different professions of faith, one that's real and one that's not. Um, this is a disturbing, in fact, the first thing I have in my notes here is, this is a disturbing passage of scripture. So here is the preparation to be disturbed, okay? Um, Matthew seven twenty one through 23 is one of the more puzzling passages, perhaps, in the entire Bible. Um, we're going to pray that with God's help, we understand more of what it means today. Um, but this was a passage, and, and I'm going to read 21, and then we'll read the whole thing. But people are, Jesus is saying that on this day, which is judgment day, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I will just keep reading. This is God's word to us today. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would be made great and mighty in our midst today, that your Holy Spirit may fill our hearts and enlighten our minds so that we would uh, not only be hearers of your word, but that we would do it and that we would do it because of you, not because of us for the joy set before us because we know we can know you. Lord, uh, we all come here today not as those who can give to you, but those who seek to receive from you. So Lord, humble us, prick our hearts, speak to us, and draw us closer to your son Jesus our Savior, our Lord, and our King. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in college, um, Matthew seven twenty one through 23 was a passage of scripture that got thrown around a lot. It seemed like nearly every single Bible study, nearly every single Christian discussion was this contrast and this balance between religion that's true versus a religion that doesn't get you in. So it was something that everybody memorized. It said, well, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And you go, wow, 
What's that mean? And then you read on and you go, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Teach in the name of Jesus. Cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then when I, will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Ouch, scary, fearful. If they're telling Jesus that Jesus is Lord, then they have the right word, right? And not only are they telling Jesus that Jesus is Lord, they say, Lord, Lord. There is fervency in their confession. There is passion. This is when Jesus tells Martha, when Martha's all wrapped up about all the things she's got to do in the kitchen and Mary won't help, Jesus says, Martha, Martha. That there's love with this. When David's son Absalom dies, he says, Absalom, Absalom. These are people that are at least expressing with their lips that they have a deep love for Jesus. Lord, Lord. It's orthodox. He is Lord. It's fervent. It seems to be public that they're coming to him on a day. You know, some people say, well, if you're ashamed to acknowledge Jesus before men, then my father will be ashamed to acknowledge you before. But they're public in their profession of this. And then they talk about the things that they've done. We've prophesied in your name. We've healed. We've performed miracles. We've casted out demons. And Jesus says, I will declare to them, depart from me. I never knew you. These are not bad people. This is not like the person who goes out and, and, you know, lives any way that they please. These are people who pray. These are people who give. These are people who fast. But what Jesus is saying here in this passage of Scripture is why? Why do you give? Why do you pray? Why do you fast? What's the motivation? And why you do what you do? Jesus is contrasting religious people with people who have a relationship with God. It's interesting that uh, it is possible to know a lot about the Bible, a lot about God, a lot about Jesus, and not know Jesus. In much the same way, and I haven't had the same kind of affection for a baseball player since he left, but I loved Albert Pujols when he was a cardinal. I still love him, and maybe it's good that he's not a cardinal anymore. I don't know. But I love him as a person, and I loved watching him as a player. And I knew lots of stuff about Albert Pujols and lots of facts about him. But if Albert Pujols saw me on the road, on the street, in Target or Schnucks, which is where I tend to see all kinds of people, I would say, Albert! And he'd go, hi. <laughs> I go, Albert, I know this about you and this about you and this about you and this about you and this about you. That's good. Who are you? I don't know you. How is it that one can devote and dedicate their entire life to knowing about God, but never knowing God. That the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and many people that are going to synagogue and going to the temple, and, and I shared a few weeks ago the amount of scripture memorization that our African brothers and sisters in Christ devote to memory is amazing. 
And my kids get mad when they have a Bible verse a week that's a short week that they have to memorize. But under Old Testament guideline that typically by the time you're 12 years old, you've got Genesis through Deuteronomy memorized. That's not verses. That's not even chapters. That's books, plural, five of them. They know. If there was a Bible quiz, they'd ace it. And Jesus says, why? Why are you doing what you're doing? And then he's also looking at this and, and saying, and it's been said before, that it is possible to miss heaven by 12 inches, the distance between your head and your heart. That there can be this sense in which you know all of these things in, in your head, but it doesn't grip your heart. I look at that and go, okay, well maybe that's the case here, except when you're saying, Lord, Lord, it seems like there's some emotion and some passion there in that confession. So what is it exactly that's going on? It says, not everyone. Notice, he doesn't say everyone will say to me, Lord, Lord, that there is a way that some will get in. Let's look closely at what these people are saying to Jesus. Saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Now, I know Lord, Lord could be defined as the subject, but really it's the address, right? Who's the subject in this sentence? We. Look what we did for you, God. Not that it's wrong to do things for God, but why? Why do you do things for God? We prophesied in your name, and we casted out demons in your name, and we did many mighty works in your name. What's the, the center focus? It's, it's me, myself, and I. It's, it's them. It's what they can do for God that they think earns them brownie points with God. What could be the difference? Tim Keller, um, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian in New York City, came up with a form that talks about the difference between religion versus the gospel. And we're going to look at a few of those now. So I think we only have three or four that we're going to look at, but go ahead and start the first one, Nick. Religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. And my acceptance is dependent upon my obedience. The gospel says something different. The gospel says, I'm accepted. Therefore, I obey. That God has in His grace already accepted me. That it's not about my obedience to God. It's about the fact that while I was disobedient, God still loved me. And God sought me out. And God removed my sins as far as the east is from the west by making a perfect substitute in my place, Jesus Christ. That there's this sense in which the, the entire Old Testament builds to this. The sacrificial system in the Old Testament that God said every single time there is sin, the wages of sin is death. Something must die. Old Testament, it was a lamb. New Testament, it was the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That it is dependent upon him and him alone. And these people who are religious think that by their religious activity, Jesus will let them in. And Jesus is wanting to say, it's not by your religious activity, it's by my religious activity on your behalf, the perfect one by which you're accepted. And after that, there's a different kind of obedience that takes place. 
Next one. The religion says motivation is based on fear and insecurity. Now let's stop there for a second. This is, can be, and, and for some people, it is my hope that this passage of scripture kind of wakes them up, okay, to the reality of, okay, if I'm seeking to get to God and I'm seeking to get to heaven and that way is through Jesus, I don't want him to say to me, depart from me, I never knew you. But in religion, the only reason why you obey is because of fear and insecurity. What's the motivation when you understand the gospel? The motivation is based on grateful joy. That there's this sense in which because the Lord has done so much for me, therefore I will live for him. Next one. Religion says I obey in order to get things from God. That's what these people are doing. These people are saying, well, look, Jesus, I did this and I did that and therefore I should get this. Great example of this, the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. It's interesting that this older brother was as far away from God as the younger brother was regarding heart distance. Regarding proximity, it's true, the younger brother ran away to a far distant country and squandered what the father had given him in wild living. The older brother stayed in the house but didn't have a relationship with the father. And he thought when the younger son came home, wait a second, dad, I have slaved for you all this time. I have kept my nose clean. I have obeyed your commandments. Therefore, I should get something. Remember the father's response? All I have is yours, son. But there's this distance that the older son has created between the father and the older son because he wanted to obey his father not to get his father, but to get his father's stuff. The gospel says, I obey to get God, to delight and resemble him. There's this sense in which I, I, I want to obey because I know that my sin and my stubbornness and my selfishness breaks my fellowship with God. It doesn't break my relationship with God. It's possible that my, my son or, or, or daughter could do something wrong. They have occasionally done some things wrong and they're sitting in the sanctuary today because they graduated into third grade and they get to be here on fifth Sundays now to hear this. So I won't tell in a specific way today since they're in here something that they've done wrong. But when they do something wrong, it doesn't mean that they cease to be my child. But the fellowship is affected. The interaction is not as good as it could be. Until what? Until there's, and we taught this to them when they were like one and a half or two years old and got put in time out. The way out of time out is I'm sorry. And the hope is that the I'm sorry is not just the word right? But a broken, repentant, apologetic, I didn't mean to do this, or I did mean to do this, but I don't like the effect, or I want to get back into good relationship with you. So obedience for the Christian is not so that they can be saved. Obedience for the Christian is I want to walk with my heavenly father. And if, I, if he tells me to go this way and I want to go this way, guess what's happening? I'm not walking with him anymore. I, I'm going the opposite direction. Next one. This one's a little bit longer, but my prayer life in religion consists largely of petition and it only heats up when I am in a time of need. My main purpose in prayer is control of the environment. There's 
the sense in which I resonate with this one, okay? I, I, I look and I go, okay, well, maybe I'm more religious than trusting in the gospel because there are times where my circumstances are not what I like and I say, okay, God, change the circumstances. And maybe God doesn't want to change the circumstances. Maybe he wants to change me in the midst of the circumstances. The gospel says, my prayer life consists of generous stretches of praise and adoration. My main purpose is fellowship with him. In other words, um, my, my wife and I shared this last week, but I'm proud and I'm happy about this. By God's grace, we celebrated our 15th year wedding anniversary this past Thursday. And if, which I gave her a gift, and, I, and we went out to dinner, the, but if I told her, honey, I read in a book that on our anniversary, it's a good idea to give your wife a gift and take her out to dinner. And I wanted to obey the book. So where would you like to go to dinner? And what gift would you like me to buy you? I'm going through the motions, right? The actions may be there, but the heart is not moved. So when one looks at, at Scripture and one looks at the Bible, one can look and, and say, okay, God says, give. God says, pray. God says, read the Bible. God says, go to church. I guess I'll do those things. Because that's what God says. Well, all throughout Scripture, all throughout the Old Testament, and all throughout the New Testament, and all throughout church history, and including today, people have done that. You know what Isaiah the prophet said? These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And guess who quoted Isaiah the prophet? Jesus. The same thing in the Gospels. These people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. It will not pass if my heart is not moved in the reality of wanting to take my wife out for our anniversary and give her a gift out of joy. Now, does every marriage have moments where you don't have that loving feeling? Yeah. Does every relationship with God have those moments when you don't have that loving feeling? Yeah. And what do we do when we know what we ought to do, but we're just not feeling it? You know what somebody would say? Well, then just don't do it. Because if you're not feeling it, you shouldn't do it. God says, Trust me, to do something in you and change your heart to where the feeling will come. That there's this supernatural thing that can be at work that causes a person to say, God, I don't want to read your word. I don't want to pray. I don't want to give. I don't want to go to church. You know that. Do in me a miracle that causes me to want to do this. What's the miracle? The miracle is a firmer grasp of the gospel. There's a song, there's an old hymn that says, to see the law of Christ fulfilled, to hear his pardoning voice, changes a slave into a child and duty into choice. So the born again spirit Filled, spirit empowered believer says, God, make my duty my choice. Remind me that because of Christ, I'm not a slave, I'm a child. And may I delight in being your child now. What does Jesus say to these religious people? He says, I will declare to them, 
notice, and Jesus does this very subtly, but it says that many people will come to me on that day. That day could be a capital D. It could be, it, this is judgment day. And it's interesting that everyone is coming to Jesus on judgment day. Jesus has said, I am the judge. And on that day, I will declare to those who are trusting in their works instead of my finished work on the cross, which I understand hasn't happened yet, but he's foretelling that. It didn't happen when he preached the sermon. He's saying, I never knew you. Think about how to get to know somebody. Let's say that Albert Pujols moves to Alton because Alton's a great city, right? <laughs> I was waiting for that. And I know all this stuff about Albert, but I begin to go on walks and play catch with Albert. And I get to hear about his life, his successes, his joys, his fears, his failures. And then later he sees me at Target. Hey, Stephen, how's it going? When are we going to get together and play catch again? That there's a relationship that's been developed. We have said from the onset of the bridge that we want God to be so much at work in our faith community and our church body that we are not those who work for God. We are those who walk with God. And that through the walking with God, inevitably we will do work for God. But as we are walking with Him, we will know Him. And He will know us. Now, did Jesus, were there people Jesus didn't actually know? Of course not. Jesus knows these people. But Jesus doesn't have an intimate relationship with them. They're not yet adopted into the family of God. And then listen to the judgment. He says, depart from me. You know what the most interesting judgment that we will ever experience, the worst possible news ever, a separation from Jesus. A lot of times, and, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I think there are a handful of dentists that I like, but I do not like a dentist working on my teeth. And, and, I think sometimes, goodness, like if I were asked to deny my faith in Jesus and a dentist comes at me with a drill and he's even, or she's even numbed me, <laughs> like, and this is uncomfortable, I don't know if I could withstand under this. And we can think about all of these things that may bring us great fear or great concern and, and, and these worries, these greatest fears and then Jesus actually will empower people, people that are being tracked down by ISIS, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and they'll be asked, deny your faith or we kill you. And they say, kill me, kill me, and I'll be with Jesus. That there's this sense in which the greatest joy that any of us could ever experience is to be with Jesus in his presence where there's fullness of joy. There's nothing greater than that. And then Jesus looks at these people and says, you workers of lawlessness, this is those who practice lawlessness. We, we talked to a couple guys and I got together and we talked about this and somebody had this hypothetical about what if I robbed a bank? Like, does that mean that, like, I have forfeited my faith? And I said, no, that, that means that you had a really bad day. <laughs> now, some people may disagree with aspects of that, but there's this sense that God wants us to live lives of daily, hourly, minute, by minute repentance not perfection 
but repentance. We will never be perfect, but we can repent and we can come back and there is forgiveness and there are no second, sorry, there are always second chances for one who repents. The one where it's scary is the one who has been found doing something either sin or religious activity, which also in some way is sin, if not done for the right reason, and says, well, I'm going to do what I want to do, and ain't nobody stopping me. That that continual, unrepentant, hard heart will inevitably, if continued, hear Jesus say, depart from me. I never knew you. So what is the hope then at the end of this passage. If you go on with verse 24, he describes two men that build houses. And it's interesting that from the look of it, both houses are built the same way. There were a couple guys that I was going to call last night about 11 o'clock at night. And then I figured I better not, they might not be awake anymore. But there are people who have built houses in our congregation that know a whole lot more about building a house than I do. But from what I gather and understand about building a house, The foundation, though it is not seen, is one of the most important parts of the house. That the house will fall if the foundation is not found and strong. And Jesus says there's two people. Notice also what happens to these houses. The exact same things. There's a storm. They live, both houses are probably close to each other. The winds blow. The rain falls, the floods came, and they beat on that house. Both the one with the foundation and the one without the foundation. We need to come to understand that relationship with Jesus does not make us invincible to suffering in this world. We will suffer and struggle. That Jesus is very clear in this world, you will have trouble. But some people focus just on that part of the verse. Jesus goes on to say, but take heart, I am have overcome the world. We will have trouble. It is naive and it is a lie and it is a false prophet who will come and tell you, you accept Jesus, you'll never have any problems. Let me give you an example. There was a person on an airplane that was a pastor who struck up a conversation with someone and they asked what they did and this guy was mid-20s and found out that the person sitting next to him was a pastor. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, I used to be a Christian. The pastor said, really? Well, what happened? He said, well, I heard somebody say that if I make Jesus my personal savior, that I'll get a bigger house and a better looking girlfriend and that I'll never have any problems. So I tried it and guess what? Bigger house didn't come better looking girlfriend didn't come and I figured you know what that guy's just full of it the pastor looked and said yep that guy is full of it that this relationship with Christ has blessings that do come with it but there will also be hardship and there will also be pain and there will also be struggle a lot of you have probably heard this story but it's about a painting of what peace is and all these people are doing these nice meadows and the mountains and these just picturesque very peaceful scenes and then somebody draws this picture of this storm and the wind and the waves and everything's going and then there's this little bird in a nest and the little bird is chirping in the midst of the storm that the bird is at peace in the midst of the storm what's that mean for the true believer It means there will be hardship and there will be pain. But the true believer knows the one that can tell the storm, peace, be still. And sometimes our Savior calms the storm and sometimes he calms his child in the midst of the storm. But he will always come through for those who call out to him. What is this thing? Says Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. What are we supposed to do? Well, it's interesting that Jesus uses the description of he who builds his house 
on the rock. You guys go back to Matthew, sorry, go forward to Matthew 16. There's a very familiar passage here where Jesus asks the disciples, who do people say that I am? The disciples say, well, some say Isaiah and Jeremiah and others say John the Baptist. And then Jesus says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter stands up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responds and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, because this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father who's in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What would have been perhaps the right response of those people who came to Jesus on that day and said, Lord, Lord, we did this and we did that and we did all these things. Perhaps one who comes to Jesus and says, Lord, Lord, when I was your enemy, you came, you rescued me, you set me on the rock, you gave me a firm place to stand, you loved me with an everlasting love, you never let go. All this time, I've been far from you, but you came near and you didn't let my sin stop you from saving me. I believe to the one who says that, Jesus will look and smile and say, enter in to the joy of your master. What's the question we're faced with at the end of this sermon? In your mind, what gets more focus and attention? What God has done for you or what you have done for God? What are you basing your salvation on? what Jesus' promises to you are or what you attempt to promise to him? Are you on the rock? Because the storms will come and the one that does not have that confession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, his house will fall with a great and mighty crash and Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Don't make that be you today. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are faithful. And thank you that you are at work in our midst to call us to your son. And thank you that while we were far from you, you came near to us and you rescued us not by our works, but because your great work through your son, Jesus. Free us, God, and protect us from evil and the evil one. May we be gripped by your grace and may we know that we must center our lives and our hope on you. Not what we do for you, but what you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, heaven is described as a place where there will be no more pain, no more crying, no more tears. It's described as a place where God will be our God and we will be his people and he will dwell in our midst. Though it is true that maybe there are streets of gold, maybe there are mansions. What the Bible writers are gripped by is the fact that we have perfect fellowship with Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. That we will never ever be separated by him again until that day comes he has given us this gift. It's a reminder 
that because Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us, one day he will fulfill his promise of coming back again. And until that day, we are called to trust in him and commune with him. But it's interesting that there is this intellectual thing that we need to be gripped by about God, but there's also this experiential thing that he wants us to have. If he didn't want us to have experiences where we get to know God better, it wouldn't be real bread and real wine slash juice cup. It would be just, just think on these things. It is our hope that if you are gripped today by what Jesus has done for you, not so much what you've done for him, but what Jesus has done for you, and you're trusting in him and him alone, you know that he's come to your rescue, then you're invited to this table where he will remind you anew and afresh. His body was broken for you and his blood was shed for you. If you're not sure, if you don't know, if you're still asking questions, then we'd encourage you to wait. But if you know, then Jesus wants to commune with you. And in much the same way that someone gets to know someone else, we get to know him by coming to this table and uh, being gripped by his love. So, um, Jesus said it was the night that the disciples betrayed him that he took the bread and he lifted it up and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body that has been broken for you. And look at that and think, you know, Jesus probably in some strange way, even though he knew what it was going to cost him, he did that with a smile on his face. That his goal and his objective in coming from heaven to earth was to bring us to God. And he knew that when his body was broken, he knew that when his blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, that, that body, his body and his blood would get us all the way home to God so we could be with him. May God make that fresh and new in your heart. And you come, if this is what you're trusting in, and this is what you believe. Let's pray. Father, prepare our hearts to take communion. Show us our sin. Give us courage to repent from it. And then show us our Savior, God, your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And as we uh, remember, his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us to get us home. May we have an appropriate confession. May we say, Lord, Lord, you rescued me. You saved me. You'll never let me go. And you'll always keep your promises to me. And I love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sorry.
there are so many promises in God's word for his children, for his people. He never lets go, never leave us or forsake us. But here's one from Jeremiah who saw before the coming of Christ what would happen when Christ came. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. He's done that in Christ. And through Christ, he remembers our sin no more. So we will not have fear if we trust in that. To hear him say, depart from me, I never knew you. Because his spirit will put his law on our hearts. And no one will have to say, know the Lord. We will all know him from the least to the greatest. If you know him, then let's stand and sing.
Amen. Lift up to him. Is that a beautiful song or what? Um, you know, I'm just thankful. I, I reflect over what all we've sung today, the message that we've heard today, uh, sharing in communion today, and it has focused on the Son. Amen? And we call him what? Jesus. Uh, what a powerful name. And so we thought it was fitting today uh, to end with a song uh, called Jesus. It's a newer song. Uh, you know, I'm thankful for all the Christian uh, songwriters and singers out there today. I'm thankful. How many of you listen to 99.1? Raise your hand. I'm thankful that they share the gospel daily, 24 hours a day in a 100-mile radius of St. Louis. And uh, this is one of the newer songs, the Chris Tomlin song called Jesus. And uh, we wanted to close with this today and proclaim his name. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is a freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, sing it out now. Who walks on the water? There is a name I call in times of trouble. There is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. Jesus, Jesus. My Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my Redeemer. There is power in your name. Sing Messiah again. Messiah, my Savior. Yeah.
Wow, I love that song. Um, why don't, it's glory to God, but we can express gratitude for the worship team and just the way that they continue to. Um, many of you also uh, have heard and have shared with me and others in our family, but my grandma uh, passed away a few days ago. And, uh, you know, it's this promise, it's this hope that through Jesus, um, we don't have to hear, depart from me, but we can hear, uh, come at her in. And, uh, but those of you who have prayed for me and my family, thank you so much. Um, I, I, uh, I'll be brief because I don't want to get emotional, but what you all mean to me cannot be put into words. And it is my hope that all of us in this church family feel that way about each other, that uh, we know we have each other's backs in prayer. We know where the hope and the source of all life and joy and strength comes from. And it's in that name, Jesus. And that he's our rock and that we continue to point each other back to that. And that he's our centerpiece and, and he's our focus. If you noticed and you paid attention, and I hope you did, but I'll state the obvious because a lot of you already got this. But in our final two songs after communion, Jesus was the subject. <laughs> And I think that our center focus has got to be, and when I get off, I make myself the subject. If we can keep Jesus as the subject, we're going to do okay. Which brings me to the introduction and the commercial of our next sermon series. Um, by the way, the Sermon on the Mount was supposed to be a summer sermon series. Believe it or not, it began back in June. God had other plans because it's the end of October and we've completed it. But we are going to spend the next three weeks, starting one week from today, uh, talking about the Christian's responsibility and privilege to pray. And to pray specifically for three things. Next week will be prayer for our country. I'm sure none of you realize there's an election going on. <laughs> but there is. And uh, what's the Christian's call in this? And what is our call to do? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 2 tells us very clearly that we're called to pray. We're called to pray for all people who are going to be elected into any office. And uh, we're going to spend time talking about that. And then we're also going to be reminded of this great truth. Whoever our new leaders become, Jesus didn't get off the throne. He's still there. And uh, we have hope in that. The next week, we're going to pray for our city. Uh, Alton's a great place, and when I say Alton, I'm going to expand it. I actually happen to live in Godfrey. Um, so it's Alton, Godfrey, just surrounding area. What does it look like for us to be a people who let our light shine before men so that people in our city, in our community, see our good works? How's that translate itself out? And then the third week as we approach Thanksgiving, we're going to pray for our church. And what's it mean, and not just the bridge, but churches all throughout this country and internationally, what should we be praying uh, for each other as brothers and sisters in Christ? So that's the next three weeks. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you guys come back. Um, if you have questions about the church or just something really resonated with you, we have these cards in the front pew. I forget to announce this, but fill this out. There's a place for comments, prayer requests. Put it in the offering basket on your way out the door. Someone will contact you this week. Um, let's receive this benediction. And now, God... To you, who sent your son Jesus when we were far from you, so that those who trust in him and keep him the sinner may hear you say, welcome home and not depart from me. May you empower us this week to live lives of grateful joy and may we spend time in prayer, not getting from you, but just getting to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May you go with God's grace and peace.